Morning, folks. Morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to let our, our dean, Susan King, say a couple words, and then I'm going to say a few words and then introduce our speaker, and we'll get to go. So let's start with uh, Susan King. It's so exciting to come up the stairs in the, up the Freedom Forum and hear this buzz going on. You know, I mean, this is what makes the university great. First of all, we've got folks from different places. I recognize some of you, some of you I don't recognize, so I hope it's public health. Welcome to your interdisciplinary. Um, and it's very exciting because we've been talking for some time, you know, about we are really proud of the interdisciplinary health communication plan. It really talks about all that. How do you bring it together? How do you really ratchet it up? How do we make this work as powerful as it can be? And so, you know, in the, in the dream world, and, and, and it's on our wish list, we get a lot of money and we really make it happen. Um, because in our strategic plan here at the journalism school, we really talk about the domains of excellence. And health communication, and interdisciplinary health communication is really one of the domains of excellence because of the scholarship that's going on here, because of that interdisciplinary area, and because of the need, the kind of world we are in, and the kind of uh, feeling of the importance of health in our lives and the role of communication in it is really powerful. But this kind of thing doesn't just happen, okay, we can put it in the strategic planning meetings, and we can put it high in our priorities list when I've got the cup going, I'm hitting everybody up, that's my job. But it has to contain more than that. And that's what today I think really celebrates. And that is the idea that we really bring people together because there is a vision. And the vision today is really today's lecture reflects that vision, and that is the vision of Jane Hill. Here is Miss Brown. Stand up. Let's <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about a village, but it takes a vision first. And Jane has, at the school, saw the role of media in communication, in health, and all those, but also saw a growing kind of field and brought together scholars into this interdisciplinary health she had that vision, and today is the first step in making that vision something more that will affect all of you young scholars in a way and help replenish all the old scholars. Oh, you know, kind of middle scholars. No, we're never old in this school. Um, and Jane really, with Joan Cates, you know, kind of started growing this and develop, developing it more and seeing the interest among our PhD candidates, and then she lured Seth Moore into this project to really move it off into the next area. And so when Seth and I were talking about um, the opportunity to really move forward our vision that was created by Jane into this health communication, he said, let's name a lecture for her. So Jane, I want to say thank you for all you have done for this school and all we will do, I hope, in your name. So round of applause for Jane. <laughs> to live up to, so get over here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Susan. Well, thanks all for coming, folks. Great to have you all here. I also wanted to just say thank you to Jane, and I'm so excited, very excited about this, the inaugural Jane Brown Lecture to honor Jane, who, uh, uh, and have our health communication moving forward. Jane was here for 35 years, is that right? Yeah. yeah. She tells me that that was really because she, after she interviewed, she didn't want to have to go on another one of those interviews. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it was really more about um, how special the MJ school is and, and how special this university is. Um, and Jane was doing health communication work before there was a field called health communication uh, and really pushed a lot of this forward. I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the partners in the interdisciplinary health communication uh, space that we're in, uh, School of Public Health and School of Information Library Science, especially Noel Brewer, who's here, and Kurt Rizzo, I think, were some of the first people uh, to work with Jane strong health communication books in the MJ school, but I think what makes it, takes it really to the next <coughs> level is that we have this interdisciplinary thing today. Uh, we, we also have a certificate program, you should know, and there's flyers in the back about that. Uh, so take a look at that if you're not enrolled in our health communication certificate program. And as uh, Susan mentioned, we're gonna be trying to do more, and we're planning on doing this lecture once a year, so uh, keep an eye out for that. I just have a couple of logistics before I introduce our speaker. Um, so we're gonna have sort of a traditional lecture kind of thing. Uh, uh, and then we'll probably have a little bit of time for questions at the end of the talk. Um, and then somewhere around noon, we're gonna sort of wrap up the talk portion uh, of our event. And if you have to leave, that's okay, but I'm hoping you'll stay. Uh, for lunch, we're gonna have lunch right outside the door here, and folks can get food.
food, come back in, we'll wait till everyone's really good. So, and then we're gonna do this thing called a research cafe, which is a, a new thing that we're doing here in the NJ school. Um, and which is sort of a guided discussion, gives us a chance to sort of dig in and have you guys participate and talk about a particular topic today, the, or the, topic, the topic of the talk, which is on perceived effectiveness. Uh, if you didn't sign up for lunch, you're out of luck, you're gonna have to leave. <laughs> Just kidding, uh, we ordered extra food, so if you didn't sign up for lunch, it's okay, please stay if you can. Uh, there's plenty of food, um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of time for you. So, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. Very excited to have Marco here. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, and we've seen each other at conferences, and are starting to work together, which we've always wanted to do, and I'm glad we get the chance to do that now. Uh, Dr. Marco Azur is a professor of health communication at the University of Minnesota School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, he's also an adjunct appointment in the School of Public Health there at the University of Minnesota. He holds a PhD in social psychology from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and he's a postdoc at the Amber School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, where we have several colleagues, very strong telecom group there. He was also an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on motivational processes that explain how mass-mediated and interpersonal communication may feed or inhibit health behavior, and how an understanding of these processes can inform the design of messages that can help people improve their health. Something near and dear to many of our hearts in this room. Um, today he's gonna present on the perceived effectiveness of health messages, conceptual issues, and future themes. Let's welcome Dr. Marco Azur. Thank you, sir. Thank you, it's really, really a pleasure to be here. In fact, it already has been a pleasure to be here. Uh, last night's dinner and this morning's project team meeting were uh, really exciting. Um, so good friends, old friends, and many people who I look forward to, to talking more with. Um, so what more can one ask to spend a Friday on? Um, well, one thing that I should note is, um, obviously I think that this is not just a um, talk, this is a Jane Brown health communication lecture. So um, it, it really is a great and deep honor to be part of the Jane Brown health communication uh, lecture series. Um, and so I just wanna spend one minute or so on, on explaining why that is. Even from afar, although we never worked together, Jane Brown has been an inspiration for me. Um, she's the type of scholar that I'd like to be and I pursue to be. I think that a key thing in, in my reading of her work and, and some of the uh, few opportunities that we had to talk um, have to do with really being aware of why we are in academia or more specifically in health communication science. I think that's true for most of us, that we are curious about finding really good answers to questions that are meaningful, have real implications for real people. And it's that idea to always being able to articulate and being aware of why, what kind of questions we really want to answer with our scholarship um, in combination with incredibly fine scholarship, so rigorous um, scientific inquiry, that really is, is a, so you're a little bit of a role model for me, Jane. Um, so, um, it, it, for example, it helps me in for myself, but also talking to grad students about every now and then I ask myself, why am I in academia? So what is it that I really want to achieve? It's not getting another study out, it's getting a study for a certain reason. Um, I always loved reading Jane's work. Isn't it amazing to read an article about something really complex and everything makes sense? It's, 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 it's something. Um, so really, it is, it, it's, it's, an, it's an honor to be part of the Jane Brown Health Communication Lecture Series. So thank you. Um, today's topic. So why would we want to spend an hour or even an entire day or part of our careers thinking and talking about the perceived effectiveness of health messages, PME. So let me, let me set it up in talking a little bit about the significance and the rationale of all of this. So perceived message effectiveness, PME, has become, an, an, has, has a really important position, has become really important in linking health messages and health outcomes. Um, it is widely used in, in scholarship, but particularly in practice. And if we start there, the significance of PME is obvious. If we would have some kind of marker of the likely effect of messages, then that would be really helpful in making sure that we, before we commit vast resources in time, and particularly in money perhaps, uh, to implementation of messages that might not work, we might used, use those scores um, to separate effective 
from ineffective messages, save ourselves a lot of money, but also importantly, possible negative outcomes. So some of the messages that we have seen um, have been used in health message um, interventions go beyond not really working, not really achieving what they um, were designed to achieve. They may in fact boomerang and have unfortunate, unintended effects. So it would be fantastic to have some kind of marker of the likely effects of a health message that we can use as a decision rule before committing funds. So from a practical perspective, um, it makes a lot of sense to take seriously the idea of something called perceived message effectiveness. So um, <coughs> this explains why um, we see so many PME measures in both in scholarship and also in, in, in practice. What is interesting, remarkable even, is that if you if if a concept is used so often, like perceived message effectiveness, you would think that it would be a good solid foundation of research um, to inform messages. There is not. So a careful analysis of messages shows um, that the conceptual basis to inform those messages is in fact remarkably thin, very often even absent. Um, perhaps as a result, the PME messages, measures that are available in the field vary wildly from each other. And it's not at all clear at this point whether that matters or not. So do all these different meshes, in fact, um, represent something called perceived message effectiveness, or are they separate concepts? So, um, whoops. I'd like to think about this as we all agree, that is a practical perspective of what the function of PME should be. So why should we have something like PME? That's clear. But what it is that we talk about when we talk about PME, that is not at all clear. So what to do? Um, I think that this suggests the need to systematically develop ideas about what PME is or supposed to be and test those ideas. And we are not there yet. So what is absent right now lacking in the literature is theory, good solid theory of PME. So we started using PME before we fully understood or agreed on what PME um, stood for. Um, to get a sense of what perhaps the problems are with respect to PME scholarship, I think it's useful to consider what was going on with the attitude construct in the late 50s and in the 60s. I think it's remarkably similar. So what was going on um, at that time in social psychological fields or domains, there was a theory ridiculously simplified into this, the idea that behavior um, could be explained by looking at attitude. Attitude was the foundation that formed, informed, and shaped uh, behavior. What then became problematic in the first half of the um, 20th century was that studies, the many studies that looked at this, were a multitude of studies that used in some way attitude, failed to find universal or consistent uh, support for this idea. Um, put differently, there were many, many studies that failed to find support for the idea that attitude might inform or shape behavior. Many were ready at that point to give up on the idea that attitude was a useful construct. So there were important calls that suggested perhaps we need to stop talking about attitude, which is an interesting notion in 2016, given that all of us use attitude. So somehow attitude survived. Why and how? This was the issue at hand. Many studies used attitude. That is, many studies suggested that he used attitude, they had this thing that he called attitude. But if you looked at all the measures that were in place, it seemed that many diverse ideas were being treated as attitude. So within that cluster of attitudinal research, we saw things like values, expected outcomes, emotion, sometimes behavior itself, uh, favorability, plans, uh, and so forth. So it wasn't at all clear whether everyone was talking about the same thing. Perhaps in part because there was, the, although there evidently were definitions um, of attitude, and most would favor the idea that attitude was something akin to an, an behavioral disposition, um, there wasn't really an agreed on very highly specific conceptual definition that would directly inform measures. What to do? Why did attitude survive? There were a number of scholars who took the nomological network approach, Cronbach and Mayall stuff, um, 
what would one do in such a theoretical approach to build theory? Start with the concept of interest, in this case, attitude. Very carefully define it. And such a definition would then help inform thinking about its antecedents and its outcomes. So all of a sudden, all of those things that had been used as attitudinal measures fit in in a process network that has become quite influential. Um, many of us still use this idea to the day. So what was the approach? Define attitude for what it is. So you could separate out things that should lead to, in this case, attitude, and attitude should have next consequences. Each indicated by possible markers. So this is a conceptual approach with immediate um, operational measurement implications. I think that this model fits perfectly on where we are today with perceived message effectiveness. We have this mass of studies that all use PME in some fashion, but it's not at all clear that all of these things tap the same idea. What if we start to look carefully about all of those measures and all of the scholarship that has been done on this uh, that used PME in some fashion? By starting out with a definition that helps us position some of these measures that were perhaps labeled as PME as antecedents of effectiveness ratings and look at what we think that conceptually should be outcomes of, um, of PME. Um, that, I think, is where we are. Um, that is what we need to do. That explains why we now have projects like Seth Noah's project that is funded by um, uh, the FDA to start making sense of this. So to begin fleshing out this theoretical approach, um, we, need, we need to do um, lots of research first starting with identifying what has been going on in this field. I think a useful first step is to consider the field that we are playing in, and that is the field of connecting somehow health messages with ultimate health outcomes. And if you think about it that way, we have incredibly good scholarship and theoretical guidance to inform those ideas. So if you look at health communication science, we have great theoretical ideas um, to build on and further improve, perhaps. Um, that can inform many of the, uh, the parts of the theoretical idea of how health messages ultimately produce their outcomes. This is just one way of looking at it. There are multiple others. There is some fast literature on message features. That literature helps us understand how certain or which message features, so design um, characteristics of a message, are associated with, with what kind of um, outcomes. For example, certain messages in the sensation value uh, domain have been associated with attention or attention grabbing. Very useful. We have process models, information processing models, but also information flow models from the mass communication literature that help us inform you know, opening this, deconstructing the black box. So what happens exactly when people are exposed to messages? How do messages ultimately reach audiences? Um, great basis for informing explanatory mechanisms. We have behavior change theories and perhaps other theories that can help us understand what ultimately a message may uh, contribute to, uh, namely set in motion a process of change through beliefs, perhaps uh, belief change ultimately leading to intention and behavior change. So we have really good science on the major components of health message effects in general. What is now interesting, I think, is if you, let me back up. Most of us will agree, if not all of us will agree, that there is great practical value of the idea of having perceived message effectiveness as a decision rule to separate, discriminate between effective and ineffective messages. That's, that's one. In moving that idea towards scholarship, what inter interestingly has happened is that perceived message effectiveness has been positioned right between health messages and message outcomes. And that makes sense perhaps, but it has consequences. Because what this suggests is by doing this, we commit to the idea that perceived message effectiveness is an explanatory mechanism that connects health message exposure to health outcomes. If we feel that this is an explanatory mechanism, then we need to commit to 
answering questions like, why would certain message characteristics lead to perceptions of effectiveness? What is the theoretical idea to believe that? Why would certain message outcomes flow be an outcome of um, effectiveness uh, perceptions? And I think then overarching that idea is, what exactly is perceived message effectiveness? So we think that simply by positioning perceived message effectiveness as a mediator between health message exposure and message outcomes, as all of the research on PME has done, implicitly or explicitly, we commit to answering the question, how does that explanatory mechanism actually work? So, put differently, anytime that we suggest that anything is an explanatory mechanism, you would think that we have good theoretical reason to argue why this is the case. And the point to make is that when it comes to perceived message effectiveness, there isn't. This is one way of looking at it. On both ends of the equation, we have really good scholarship, and this is just illustrative. The, 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 the lists are much longer. So we have great, great literature and scholarship to inform thinking about health messages, great, great scholarship and literature to think about message outcomes, and in the middle is a wasteland <laughs> of nothing. There is no theory of how to connect PME to these, these things. So there, there really is, is a remarkably thin um, basis for all um, the use of PME. So let's fix it. Um, first, perhaps, why do we find ourselves in this situation? So why are we comfortable, seemingly comfortable, with assigning such an important role to, to this concept, yet not really paying as much attention to conceptual development of this construct. I think a part of it that it seems obvious what we're talking about. So perceived message effectiveness, what does it mean? Well, it's perceptions of how effective a message is. How much more do you need? I think that this may explain that um, so often, particularly in, in, in research that was not designed to really systematically test ideas about perceived message effectiveness, but needed it somehow, right, to add just measures by looking at other studies or by just coming up with measures that surely indicate perceived message effectiveness. So we think that, that because it's um, um, deceptively simple, we often stop thinking, really thinking through what actually is it what we're talking about with PME and move on towards, um, towards measures. So as a result, um, we have seen an incredible number of different operationalizations, measures of, um, um, of PME across different studies. And uh, this, is, this is just a screenshot of um, an... Um, and, and a review that we did a few years ago um, of uh, more than 20 studies. And we found, and this is just a really a little bit <coughs> overview of all of the items that have been used in separate studies. And just if you do a phase validity sort of screening of this, uh, multiple things come to mind. So one thing is if you just look at a couple of keywords here, things that come, uh, that return quite a few times in this ad was persuasive, made a strong argument, relevant to me, made me feel concerned, um, effective, convincing, compelling, reasonable, logical, rational, true to life. At least one of the things that one <coughs> might wonder, just by looking at these, and these examples, is um, wouldn't this suggest, implicitly suggest, again, it's just one example of looking at this, um, something have to do with how we process these messages? So here's on the one hand a stream of research, Jim Dillard has been important in this regard, that show that processing of health messages very often works heuristically. So we don't consciously reflect on all kinds of things, deconstruct the messages and deliberately think about whether we agree or disagree. <coughs> some, of these some of these measures of perceived message effectiveness seem to ask us to do that very thing. So at the very least we see a possibility that there is a disconnect between how most of these messages in fact will be processed in the real world and what we make participants do when we ask them to evaluate 
a message in terms of its likely effectiveness. So this is just one of many questions that we thought and um, and a review of all the messages that have been in place um, allows. Here's another example. So in um, developing a research plan for um, evaluating existing perceived message effectiveness <coughs> measures in a tobacco domain, um, Seth and his team have reviewed um, an, an illustrative sample of measures and found, actually, this just in, 18, not 16, but 18 different domains in terms of the persuasive uh, mechanism or outcome. So uh, credibility, um, self-efficacy, motivation to quit, all kinds of different persuasive outcomes. 18, <coughs> so if you look at the body of work on measures, so all of those measures, they might represent as many as 18 different persuasive domains. This should not matter much if we can assume that all of those 18 different types of measures in fact load onto the very same thing. So it doesn't really matter if you go for this one or this one. It's unlikely though that 18 different persuasive categories all represent the same concept. So further suggestion that we are probably doing very different things in the literature right now, even though all of us may be talking about assessing perceived measures effectiveness. So such an analysis allows the question, um, is it possible that all of these measures that have been in place reflect not one single PME factor, but is it possible that um, perceived measures effectiveness is a multidimensional um, concept? If so, then we still maybe good to go in terms of all the measures that are in place, we just need to carefully lay out what factor, what, what aspect of PME all of these measures load on. So it's an important uh, conceptual question. But once again, interestingly, the, the work that has been done on the dimensionality of uh, PME has been more empirical. So we had data, some of our labs had data, we analyzed, factor analyzed um, those um, items to see if it was uni or multidimensional. Um, that's just a couple of examples. Um, the few studies, or the few labs that looked at this found evidence that we made that things may be more complicated than we, than we initially thought, that PME is a multidimensional concept. Um, here is an example of three labs that looked at, that factor analyzed the items that they use in their studies and found um, support for the idea that, um, that their PME measures reflected two factors. Um, labeled as uh, impact and attribute, first started with Jim Dillard um, and his colleagues, and um, also from uh, Melanie Wakefield's lab, um, although they didn't call it attribute and impact, very similar ideas. Um, Seth and his team also looked at uh, utility or cognitive instrumental versus perhaps effective components of PME. In our own work, um, we identified factors that we labeled placidness and uh, persuasiveness. Um, so there is some evidence um, <coughs> that in some cases there may be overlap. In fact, if you carefully look at the items that we're being used, these ideas overlap somewhat. So perhaps there is evidence that we may be looking at at least a, a um, two-dimensional factor. Well, let me just build on this illustratively to suggest how that kind of thinking about dimensionality may lead us to flesh out theory on um, the conceptual meaning and measurement of PME. So first though, libation. So we were interested in um, perceived message effectiveness as an outcome in an, in an, in an IDA-funded project uh, a couple of years ago, where ultimately what we wanted to do is um, look at brain processes through fMRI method methodology to see how adolescents respond to video ads encouraging or discouraging to use marijuana and other, and other drugs. And in the first set of studies, we, um, we looked at evaluations of um, 
of public service announcements because we were ultimately what we wanted to do is we wanted to have uh, expose adolescents in the scanner in the fMRI scanner to a set of <coughs> non health related ads weak ads and strong ads so that was our initial thinking but what is a weak ad and what is a strong ad and that is how we encountered on the literature of perceived message effectiveness so that seemed to be an idea um, useful to identify weak and strong messages even before there was evidence of whether they in fact were weak and strong. So that's how it all started in our lab. Um, this is from one study, 190 um, adolescents. Um, in this particular study we had an, 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 a pool of 79 anti-drug video ads and participants, each participant rated 10 of them. And we measured real-time valence and arousal using um, something that looked like this. So uh, participants watched ads online, um, so on a computer screen, and had an, um, an cursor, the mouse, to at each moment of the 30 seconds of each ad could indicate how they felt about this ad. So we first <laughs> explained to them what we meant with arousal and valence. Then they saw the board stirred up after explanation reflected arousal. And so for each moment they could indicate the extent to which they were aroused or the extent to which they thought it was positive or negative. That was in real time. Then after ad exposure, we asked again about valence and arousal, so post-exposure, and we asked about the number of PME <laughs> items. Um, why? And I think this is important for, for how we may begin to think about perceived mass effectiveness. We started on the idea <coughs> that the immediate response to a health message is effective, is emotional. It is when you see something personally relevant and you get this, this, this feeling here, the physiological feedback. That is the first thing we argued happens in response to a message that has signal value, that might be personally relevant. So very much based on the arousal valence emotion literature. That explains why we had real-time collected real-time data on arousal and valence because we thought that that is, after mass exposure, that is the immediate thing that happens, which would suggest that next, any other more cognitive translation perhaps um, would, um, would happen, for example, translated into perceived effectiveness ratings. That was the logic of it. So what happened? We collected data and we ran effective analysis on uh, the perceived effectiveness items that we used. These are the items that we used. I am not at all arguing, given what I've learned over the years, that these are the items that really truly represent perceived effectiveness. In fact, there are problems with them. Um, but let us look at what happened if you just if you look at these items. First, how convincing is the ad, how believable, how memorable, how good, how pleasant, positive. Particularly this set is probably, I would say, among the most widely used of PME measures available in the literature right now. A factor analysis showed a very clear division in the sense that how convincing, believable, memorable and good an ad was perceived to be loaded on one factor, how pleasant and positive loaded on the second measure. We interpreted that at a time as perceived persuasiveness, perceived blessedness. And next we started looking at how in our data these two factors were positioned and some interesting things happened. A couple of things and I'll walk you through this. Um, first, these two factors correlated with each other but not to such an extent that we should be worried about that we are actually talking about the same thing. So the shared variance um, is I think sufficiently low to, um, to justify that we might look at the relative effects of these two factors within the same model. Um, also interesting is that perceived pleasantness correlated strongly with um, post-exposure valence and persuasiveness strongly with post-exposure arousal, but not vice versa. So it seemed that they connected either with um, one of the arousal valence um, components or the other. Um, similarly, see that arousal and valence themselves hang to, uh, hung together but not so much that we really are talking about the same thing. This is interesting. We, s we thought about this in terms of it connects with how we thought about the underlying basis 
of PME, effective and uh, so effective responses. But of course, this was cross-sectional. These were the measures that we collected after exposure, but we had real-time data. So we looked at our real-time arousal and valence data, so um, measured before participants responded to uh, these two PME um, factor items. And those of you who worked with real-time data, there's a reason why not all of us are working with real-time real data, I think. It's complicated. Um, we have used and decided on four markers of how you combine all of those data so that you can analyze them. Uh, we looked at the mean, the peak, so the most intense um, uh, response regardless of where it happened, the end, uh, the sort of final rating, um, and also an average of peak and end, as is consistent with much in our literature, particularly the pain literature reported pain literature. Okay, what, what we saw is um, that if you look at the antecedents, and in this case we can't really talk about antecedents, um, the perceived blessedness of a message is really strongly related with valence responses in real time, so while watching the ad. Um, whereas the perceived persuasiveness of a message was very strongly related to arousal um, um, ratings reported in real time. This led us, and this is where I'm going back to what I started out with, so how are we to make sense of PME? This led us to theorize, based on this particular data set at least, that we might want to think about a process in which a health message induces at least two types of effective responses, one having to do with intensity of the response, one having to do with the positivity or negativity, which in turn may be associated, form, be cognitively translated into perceived message effectiveness um, aspects that may differ in a unique way from each other. Um, we also have now evidence to, to look at what happens next, so how do these two dimensions of perceived message effectiveness next translate in what people do with the message in terms of beliefs and attitudes and intention. And uh, so we have run these, run these um, uh, analysis in a couple of different samples. And in those samples, at least, we found fairly consistent, no, consistently, that perceived persuasiveness then leads is associated <coughs> with things like beliefs and attitudes and intention, but not perceived pleasantness. And this only adds to the usefulness of, of such an approach because once again, if these two dimensions of PME have the exact same outcomes, well, then it is less important than if these two dimensions have distinct outcomes. Put differently, if this would have been my PME measure, I may have concluded, I may have derived very different conclusions about ads to keep or to dismiss compared to if I would have had these items in my PME measure. So how you measure PME, therefore, becomes very important. It can lead to different conclusions about what ads or what messages to keep. Um, I'm really excited about that dimensionality approach because it makes you think. Um, also very excited that across a fairly large number of studies across different domains, we found support for this, this um, two-dimensional factor solution. We also need to be careful because in the recent data sets that I'm really excited about, it was a uh, partnership with the American Indian Cancer Foundation um, who run out of uh, Minneapolis. So we collaborated with them on um, HPV vaccination messages and uh, worked, uh, had a sample of 300 um, parents of American Indian youth representing the major tribes in, in, uh, in the Midwest. And we had the same measures. So we, we exposed um, these, um, these parents and caretakers to one of three different messages, asked the same battery and more um, of, of items that you saw before. And we ran factor analysis and ran many different other analysis and these items really reflect only one dimension in this particular sample. That happens, it makes us think, I think it's a good thing, because I'm now really working on ideas, trying to develop ideas. Is this, you know, sometimes data happen? Or can we think about, perhaps there's something about a sample 
what is unique about how people make sense of behaviors that, that translate into what people do with perceived effectiveness meshes. Maybe these meshes become different, people construe them different, depending on who they are or what the behavior is that we're asking about. Um, perhaps something about a message that induces different kind of thought processes. Whatever the answer is, I think that the complexity of what perceived effectiveness meshes are, so what people do with them, is much greater than we have assumed thus far. And it doesn't really matter what you do, you just ask this question and you run your analysis. Um, so I think that the dimensionality of um, PME is an, is an important area of, um, of attention in the, in the next couple of years in this, in this domain. So let me move towards full circle, so to speak. Um, so um, what really is the issue, I think, is when we, again, when we position perceived effectiveness of health messages, the linchpin and the connector of health message exposure and message outcomes, we need to know what we're talking about. So how effective is a message perceived to be? I think the key is that we, that we agree on this, this particular part of this, uh, this question. What do we mean when we say what effective is? So what, do we, wh what is the conceptual definition, so to speak, um, of effective? And so there are a couple of ideas, if, if, you, if from that perspective, there are a couple of ideas that come to mind that, that allow some kind of checklist of, well, these, if we, if we buy into this idea, and these are some um, um, things that an, a good PME measure should um, confirm to, conform to. So, example, if you look at the persuasion literature, we have identified a number of different features, like measure sensation value, um, like argument quality, think about narrative uh, persuasion. So features that have been associated with some kind of persuasive outcomes. The logic then has it that those features themselves are not PME. They are a source, they, are, they lead to effectiveness um, perceptions. So asking about or interpreting PME as in terms of these message features may not be the most useful way of moving forward. Why may that be relevant? Because quite a few measures currently used, in fact, do this. So it really is about um, looking at certain message features and asking about them that would make for PME. So we think that that may not be best. A second, um, and one that I care deeply about, we design health messages based on the idea that we want to give our audience something that they need, which means that we do an audience analysis, then we design a message so that it targets those beliefs or ideas or, or anything else um, that we think are particularly relevant. This explains why some of our messages target attitudes, for example, others do self-efficacy, depending on where the audience is. If you look at the types of measures that have been used in the PME literature, and also the type of outcome variables that have been used in measuring actual effectiveness. To start with the latter, it really only has been attitude and attention that have been used as outcome variables to assess the predictive validity of PME measures. Put differently, um, participants would be exposed to a message, then perceived message effectiveness measures were used, and then those scores on those measures were correlated with attitude and attention. Why would it make sense that you would find a strong correlation between exposure to a message that focused on self-efficacy and then link effectiveness ratings with attitude if the message was never intended to do something with attitude to begin with? So a general point to make, I think, is why are we not considering articulating our perceived effectiveness measures in terms of the specific outcome variable that the message was designed to change to begin with? And so there basically is almost none of that in the, in the, um, in the literature right now. Similarly, we want someone or a group of people to be encouraged by our messages. So there is a referent 
there's always a reference in our messages. We think audience when we design our messages. Most of the PME messages do not have a reference in them. Uh, for example, in the study that we looked at today, the Iser et al. study, we did not have a reference in our measures. Big mistake, I think, now. So we would ask people how convincing was the message? Well, for whom? We know from motivational biases that we like to think about other people when it comes to personally relevant uh, messages. So I may think that this message is really important for Brian. Not for me, because it's not relevant for me. He's the risk taker, not I. Um, so simple solution, and something that Seth has been uh, uh, designing his work on, uh, and it really uh, disentangling the relative importance of what happens if you have a non-specific me uh, measure, like this ad is convincing, versus this ad was convincing to me. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to move towards that. There are other issues with the literature. I think this was not the platform to really go through all of them. Um, but, but based on the review of all those ideas, we moved to a suggestion for a definition, um, basically to shoot at. So all of this informed an, an, uh, uh, an idea that we proposed a few years ago. What may be a starting point in terms of how can we conceptually define perceived message effectiveness? We argued that the extent to which a message uh, recipient believes that a message will affect him or her personally in terms of the particular message objectives would be addressing many, many of the problems that we currently see with, with, uh, with the measures, excellent measures um, in place. Um, I emphasize that this is a measure that I think that we should now try and prove wrong. And this is based on, an, on, an, um, on a review of existing measures. We don't have data on this. This measure has not been used, but it, you know, in theory addresses many of the problems. So I think what we should do now is go back to how do we build and test theory. Start with a conceptual definition. We offered suggested one. This does allow us to think about what would come before this. Well, we argued in our work that um, these kind of perceptions should be induced, and we have some evidence for it, by effective responses. So already, by looking at this, we can de rename almost a fairly sizable group of measures that are currently um, uh, in the field where people ask or assess or treat effective responses as if it were perceived message effectiveness. So we suggest that it may not be perceived effectiveness, but it may induce effectiveness ratings. It comes first as an antecedent. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done here. I think the work on actual effectiveness is um, needs more unpacking of that process. I think that then looking at attitude and tension is too simplistic, how the things work. And this is what I would add to um, the initial um, visualization of this nomological network. Um, I think that we should be open to the idea that each of these may have dimensions. For example, we know that some of the reason action variables now have multiple dimensions, very useful development of the theory. We know that message features have multiple dimensions and it's useful to look at these separately. And there is reason to believe that effectiveness itself, perceived effectiveness itself, may be um, multidimensional. Um, how to do that? I think that what is needed now are at least two, theme, two things. It so happens that we are working on them. Um, one is a, uh, an, uh, a project that Seth is uh, uh, taking the lead on. It's a review culminating in a meta-analysis of existing measures, in this case in the tobacco domain. Um, this is that work that I referenced um, that already has led to the possibility that extant measures may represent as many as 18 different persuasive uh, categories. So that really is necessary to make sense of what is going on right now. I think in the next step, based on an initial conceptual definition, we need to test the validity of that idea relative to rival ideas within, within the same studies. Um, this reflects, I think, and here's the full circle, something that I would say really reflects Jane Brown's approach to research. It is real world thinking. So we th really just didn't think, how, how would this happen? How do we think this happens? But in a scientifically rigorous uh, way, 
um, in this case leading to um, advancements in how we think perceived measures effectiveness really might work. Thank you very much. That's, I think that's a terrific way of thinking. So, um, in fact, this morning we were, we were discussing a an, an, uh, an, uh, similar, th 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 similar idea in a sense that what do we do when we ask people to, to self-reflect on how effective a message is for them or for anyone else? Um, there are some in the literature who claim that, that, that human beings are incapable of doing that. So that there is something about simply asking people to reflect on effectiveness that we don't fully understand, I think. So yes, is it possible that um, a response, so to, to uh, response to questions asking about the likely effect of a message are sort of a different way of um, a different way of getting at some of these processes, but perhaps in a less precise manner because we ask people to comment on it. I think it's possible. I think that with the though with how you conceptualize this. I think it's possible to conceptualize this in such a way that it is an explanatory mechanism in the sense that you need this so it doesn't fall away in mediation analysis. <laughs> um, ideas like how, if, if you simply ask how effective this is message, I'm not sure that that is very meaningful. I don't think that that bites, that you need to have an answer like that to next um, lead to belief change. I agree with you that those, those items, I think, may be sort of a dead end kind of, um, I don't think that much would happen after that. But in terms of, um, particularly for more personally relevant, where there really hasn't been a process, an internal process, where you think about the message and you come to the conclusion how you feel about this message, it's self-persuasion. Um, I think that in those cases, this in fact becomes an explanatory mechanism that next informs drives um, uh, change. What I like most about your approach is that perceived message effectiveness, I, I don't believe it's a medium, but I do believe it's a valuable outcome as a way to evaluate, uh, evaluate messages or, pro or programs or, or campaigns. So I like it because I think it probably is a really good marker for the most part, give or take the non-conscious process. I just don't think it's the necessary path. The, 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 I, I hear you. The, 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 the trick, of course, is that I think when, when we treat it as very useful for getting a sense of, of what a message does, I think we implicitly then assume that, that if we have that, we also know that down the road it, we will see the change that we want to uh, see. So implicitly it's still built on the idea that it somehow does inform or reflect at the, at the, at the very least uh, next outcomes. Well, yes, um, there are studies. Um, I would say the most noteworthy is probably Jim Dillard's work. Um, at least three studies, one cross-sectional, one experimental, one longitudinal, if I recall, um, in which he tested 
again, he, he primarily looked at attitude and attention as outcomes of, um, he correlated it with perceived effectiveness ratings. And in the experimental study, I think he selected messages high and low in effectiveness and then looked at effects on attitude and attention. So there is some evidence. It, it is so, but it really is looking at whatever went in here and down the road. Yeah. So I, I think that it, it cannot be as simple as that. But, but there is some evidence, yes, that there are those correlations to exist. No. Yeah, uh, that is really important. It's um, again going back to the, that very productive meeting that we apparently had. Uh, apparently, very productive meeting that we had this morning. Um, in terms of uh, so, we were talking about how Seth has reached out to uh, linguist, ling linguistic um, um, experts in um, how do people make sense of this semantically. So what does effective mean? So if you have the same question, so we can agree on a conceptual definition and, and a theory, let's assume that that is true. That is what we talk about. And then from that we derive <coughs> measures. And so necessarily we, 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 we rely on semantics. But how do people make sense of that? What, does, what do people think with the terms effective? Just like in health, when, when you ask about health, we know that in different cultures people construe health differently. And so those measures all of a sudden take on a different meaning that may or may not be consistent with the original conceptual definition that we, that we uh, started with. Point incredibly well taken. Um, I don't have a ready answer to that. So do I, do I accept the possibility that this plays out different different cultures? Oh, absolutely. I think that is actually to be expected. Um, it makes it more of a daunting task to agree on a conceptual definition that will inform theory on it. Exactly. No, I completely agree, and and I think it it, it, it is possible by if if you take seriously the idea that that message features uh, research that really res, uh, sort of resides here, so an understanding about how music works, for example, um, by separating it out from those holistic measures, um, we can actually test those ideas. Um, and with respect to behavior, I very strongly believe in the idea that um, messages, mass communication. Um, the effects are, I think, best understood in setting in, um, in motion a process. Um, 
And so to really look at this, I think, is, is, is a valid approach to, to then see what happens next down the road. So that's why I get a little nervous of research that only, only looks at intention and behavior as outcomes, because I think that what messages really do doesn't happen immediately in terms of intention information.